Welcome to Access Asia. I'm Yuka Hoye. Coming up in this edition. 14 pro-democracy leaders have been convicted of subversion in Hong Kong in the largest trial under the national security law imposed by Beijing. We'll hear from Amnesty International. North Korea has fired a barrage of suspected ballistic missiles days after it failed to put another spy satellite into orbit. So where does Pyongyang's space program stand? Police in Thailand are at war with monkeys. A new offensive aims to round up and send away thousands of them, but the marauders are hard to catch. 14 prominent pro-democracy activists have been found guilty in a landmark subversion trial in Hong Kong. They were among the 47 opposition figures charged with trying to overthrow the government by organising an unofficial primary for the 2020 legislative elections. They were arrested under the Beijing-imposed national security law. 31 of them had already pleaded guilty. While Beijing and the Hong Kong government welcomed the verdict, rights groups and foreign governments have voiced concern. Let's bring in Sarah Brooks, China Director at Amnesty International. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for joining us. Hi. Glad to be here. So how significant is this verdict and what does it mean for free speech in Hong Kong? This verdict is incredibly important. It adds to a chorus of alarm bells that despite what the Hong Kong authorities say, all is not normal uh, in Asia's global city. Um, this points to an increasing crackdown on freedom of expression and all of the fundamental freedoms that were really essential to the vibrancy and the spirit of Hong Kong, whether that's the right to peacefully express yourself or to demonstrate or robust public participation, has very much closed down in the wake of the Beijing-imposed national security law. Now, this conviction comes just days after six people were arrested for inciting hatred against Beijing by making a tacit reference to June the 4th. That's the anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre. 35 years on, why does China so badly want to keep to stop people remembering it? We see that the efforts to quash, to silence, to make the memory of Tiananmen disappear have been largely effective in mainland China. But for 30 years, up until 2019, Hong Kong was really a bastion. It was a space where people could come together every year on June 4th in Victoria Park to remember, um, to call for justice and accountability for victims of the crackdown in Tiananmen Square and in the suppression that followed. Um, and to to really put the spotlight on the Chinese government for human rights violations for which they have never been held accountable. Um, the arrests that we see today targeted notably Chao Hangtong, who was one of the organizers of that vigil um, and who will spend this year's June 4th in detention at celebrating her 1000th day um, being detained under national security charges. So Hong Kong was a place where people could commemorate the Tiananmen event until it couldn't. Is pro-democracy activists effectively dead then in Hong Kong? And what does it mean for the wider human rights situation in China? The imposition not only of the national security law, but just this year in March, the adoption of a new set of national security legislation under Hong Kong's own basic law has really meant that the potential for people to stand up and speak out, to be critical of the government, um, is, is virtually non-existent. And yet I think what is so crucial is that people still seek ways to stand up. They try to find ways of commemorating uh, June 4th, wherever they may be. Uh, and so this year, Amnesty is inviting people to join our online vigil to light a candle using an Instagram filter to be present in the cities and the spaces where you are so that we can um, come together in ways that uh, unfortunately are no longer possible for those working for human rights and fundamental freedoms in Hong Kong. Now, in this kind of situation, are there any hopes left for the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong? I believe it's essential to say that 
they are that they are still there. That individuals um, like Chow Hung Tong, yes, are detained. Yes, continue to face uh, significant harassment, and yet they fight back and they stand up. And and Hung Tong is particularly strong in her uh, critiques, in her self defense in court, and in standing up for the values which underlie Hong Kong's basic law and the fundamental freedoms, which were for such a long time critical to, to civic uh, society in, in the city. That's Sarah Brooks from Amnesty International. Thank you so much for speaking to us. North Korea has fired around 10 suspected ballistic missiles towards its eastern sea. This comes hot on the heels of a rare admission by Pyongyang that it had failed to put another military reconnaissance satellite into orbit. Last November, the regime successfully launched its first spy satellite and said it was planning three more this year. Shelley Sitbon from our news desk joins me for more. Hi, Shelley. Hello. So, um, North Korea failing to launch a, 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 a satellite into orbit, how much of a setback is this uh, for Kim Jong-un's satellite programs? Well, we can look at the image of uh, this explosion of what uh, the, the satellite that was being taken, brought, launched into space. Uh, these images obviously show uh, that this is not a success by no means. It was filmed by, it was captured uh, by Japanese cameras and uh, we can see it, yes, that it uh, Basically, it could be seen as a, as a setback, a failure. Indeed, the satellite is not up in space, not in orbit. But it's also the fact that the test uh, has been carried out, that the launch has been carried out. It's also what the North Koreans have been trying to show. They've carried out many tests. They've succeeded once uh, in November. We'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, and actually, that was a, a big success. And now they want to move forward and they want to make a new such, uh, such uh, launches. And, well, the fact that the, the explosion uh, had that appearance, well, it proves that the North Koreans were using a type of engine that is similar to the ones used by the Russians. And maybe this proves that there's some kind of, you know, work and, uh, working process together, that the Russians helped the North Koreans develop this specific rocket engine, which, you know, is a way for the North Koreans to show maybe that they also have some kind of interesting cooperations now. So a failure actually demonstrated uh, its progress made in the last few years. So concretely, how far has North, Korea's, uh, North Korea come in its space and rocket programs? Well, we can see the images from November, this great success for the North Koreans. And it was uh, celebrated as such, this first uh, military reconnaissance satellite, a spy satellite, launched uh, into space. And they want to, you know, send new ones into space about for this year alone. And they think their goal is, is, not, is not negative, is not offensive. They want to see uh, the, the, the Southern Korean uh, and the U.S. military troops on the ground to be able to observe what's going on in the region. And they say that's, that's the goal and they want to have this whole uh, series of uh, satellites to monitor what is happening on the ground. They say it, it's not offensive. So is that where they're going? It's shifting more towards military, a space-based reconnaissance after years of developing nuclear weapons? Yes, and, but they continue on both fronts. It all goes together. Uh, and uh, we can see some images maybe of this cooperation. Uh, Kim Jong-un was recently, uh, in, a few months ago, uh, in Russia, looking at different um, weapons and uh, military means to see how to develop and how to cooperate with the Russian military and to develop this uh, together. But yes, they, they, the Koreans, the North Koreans, they really want to keep their know-how and their nuclear uh, bombs, their nuclear weapons. We don't know exactly how many of them uh, there are different estimates they have but you know recently a few days ago uh, China Japan and South Korea have called to denuclearize the the peninsula the Korean peninsula and North Korea says no it's it's right to have these nuclear weapons that's of course is a, a risk for the whole region and that's what uh, various countries like China uh, like uh, like the US have been saying and actually some analysts say that the recent steps taken by North Korea is made actually to protest against that general call uh, to denuclearize the peninsula, which China joined that call to denuclearize. Calls for concern then. Shelley, thank you. Now, they can be a key.
cute tourist attraction until there's too many of them. After grappling for years with wild monkeys running amok, authorities in the central Thai city of Lopburi have launched an offensive. But bringing peace to the human-ape conflict is no easy undertaking. Aurore Dupuis has the story. Oh my god! Oh no! Cheeky <laughs> monkeys snatching food from tourists. It might be amusing to some, but for Thai businesses, it's becoming a burden. Some shopkeepers have had to put up fences to prevent macaques from getting in. When there are a lot of monkeys around, customers are scared to buy anything at the shop. Only our long-time customers aren't frightened. Monkeys have long been a tourist attraction in Thailand. But local authorities say there's been too much monkeying around. They've launched an operation to capture more than 2,000 apes, but catching them is trickier than expected. Monkeys are smart. If some of them get caught in the cage, the others outside won't enter the cage, even if there's food inside, because they've already learned what's happened to their friends. Once captured, the monkeys are cleaned and numbered for monitoring. Some will be neutered and kept in large enclosures. Others will be released to keep the monkey business alive. That's all for this edition of Access Asia. Remember, you can watch this and previous episodes of the show on our website, YouTube channel and other platforms. See you next time.